Now I'm going to play it through a second time, slow motion, so that you can hear the tight, uh, hear what's being said and note the tight correspondence to what the eyes are looking at. And the first time I'll through, I'll play it without saying anything, so you can just take it in. The second time I'll do sort of a play-by-play -play so that you can get a sense of exactly what it is, because sometimes it can be hard to tell the first time around. Here we go. <laughs> Let's try this one more time. Here we go. Now put the five of hearts, and now you notice are already looking at the fives of hearts, that is below the eight of clubs. Now I'm going to play it for you one more time in fast speed, and what I want you to notice is that the person actually is looking up to the club card above the um, above the five of hearts that they're looking at before they even hear clubs. Okay, so that it's going to be an eye movement to this card right there, and go ahead and watch that. Now put the five of hearts that is below the eight of clubs above the three of diamonds. Let's do that one more time. And once again, watch the exact timing of when the eye movement from this card to this card starts. It's very, very fast. Now put the five of hearts that is below the eight of clubs above the three of diamonds. Once again, the speaker didn't even get to the end of eight of clubs. It was, so this is what we call a sort of anticipatory eye movement or something based on prediction. That is above that is enough to trigger the eye movement. It's sort of remarkable. Okay, so that's eye movements in the visual world, but you can also tell and you can see that there's a tight correspondence between the language and actually where the eyes move. There's a lot of signal there, but it's also very noisy. The eyes move around all over the place. The timing is different from moment to moment, to trial to trial. So how do we actually systematize this? So first of all, this is um, uh, the kind of eye tracker that was used in this experiment. So you can see it's something that is on the uh, on this on the head of the um, of the speaker, and there is an external camera right here that is facing the scene, and then there is a um, a camera that you can't actually see, which is um, bouncing infrared light off of the eye off of this uh, mirror, which is transparent glass for vis visible frequencies but is a mirror for infrared and is bouncing uh, something off, bouncing light, infrared light off of the eye of the, uh, of the participant. So in a visual world experiment, this is uh, one of the classic um, studies that has been done. Uh, this is an example of looking at the time course of spoke, individual spoken word recognition. So how long does it take to recognize a word like beaker in the time course of how you're hearing it um, as the word beaker? So, um, the instruction to the experimental participant might be something like pick up the beaker and simply the uh, experimenters simply look at the eye movements during this period. So here's how this go. Here's how this goes. This is done over many different trials and the information from the trials is aggregate, aggregated to get um, fine-grained average time course information. So this is an experimental setup where um, I'm sort of schematizing what would be in the visual screen here there are four objects. Um, this was done in the 1990s, so it's a very low-tech display. Um, there's a beaker in the upper left, a speaker in the upper right, a beetle in the lower left, and uh, a carriage in the lower right. And so notice that, um, that there is sort of a sound relationship between the beaker, the speaker, and the beetle. In particular, if the target word is beaker, then there's something called the cohort word, which is a word that sounds like just like the target at the very beginning. There's also what's called a rhyme, a rhyme uh, word, which is the uh, speaker, which has the same ending as the target word beaker, beaker and speaker rhyme. Co uh, cohort means it's in the cohort of the words that have the same beginning. Rhyme means it's in the set of words that have the same rhyme. And then there's a fourth word that, there's a fourth image whose label doesn't sound anything like the target. So we're interested in the time course of spoken word recognition. In particular, for example, do people start uh, uh, start figuring out, discriminating whether 
the word that's being spoken is one word or the other, one of the label or the other, before the word even finishes. Okay, and so here's the way that this is done. So the um, the trial, every trial begins. Uh, this is an experiment that is done over many different trials. Every trial begins with the basic instruction. Look at the cross. And so once that basic instruction is done, the participant should look at the cross. So the idea here is to get the eye away from anything that is of interest in terms of analysis. And then after that happens, there's another instruction. Pick up the beaker. That's the core instruction. And so what will happen in practice is, since the participant is interacting with this display, the participant will look at what they're going to interact with. And uh, so in this case, for example, um, first of all, it takes about 200 milliseconds to actually initiate and execute an eye movement, uh, what's called a saccadic eye movement. And so generally in a trial like this, nothing will happen for the first 200 milliseconds. But after that, for example, the person might look very quickly at the beaker and um, spend all their, their eye mites linger there as they're then moving the mouse to go pick it up with the, uh, the interactive environment. And so very soon after 200 milliseconds, we might categorize where they're looking as just being in the green area, the, the beaker area. So that's one trial. Uh, in a second trial, they might alternatively take a longer time and then execute the saccade to the beaker. So there would be a later, um, a later time when the eye hits one of the four areas of interest. And that, that area of interest would be the beaker once again. On a third trial, they might, for example, look at the beetle first and then look at this beaker later on. And so the time course might look like this. First, they're in the area of interest, which is the red area of interest, the cohort interest area, then the green target area. And they might have all sorts of different behaviors and so forth. So what we'll get is over a large number of trials like this, we'll sort of get it. Each trial will give us a time course as a function of how long has elapsed from the beginning of the word beaker here. The eyes will be in any of a number of places. And um, the no color means that the eyes have not entered any of the four areas of interest. Then what's done is that there these numerous trials are aggregated to a proportion. So at any particular time slice, what proportion of the trials are the eyes in any of the four areas of interest. And so for example, one pattern which we might hypothesize would be theoretically interesting would be um, the pattern that's schematized here, which is that at the very beginning, not only the target, but the cohort competitor have increased, have a rapid increase in proportion of fixations. That would be if before the word is over, Participants are already discriminating which of the four words it is, or which of the words it is, and since beetle and beaker sound the same at the beginning, participants will look equally likely to both. But once more information comes in, once you hear the k, then actually they start looking even more at the beaker than at the beetle, and then looks to the beetle will fall off. In contrast, the unrelated word, for example, will never garner as many eye movements as uh, either the target or the cohort. So that might be a theoretically predicted pattern, and we might schematize this by taking a time window like this and then just averaging the proportion of eye movements within that time window. And so we get, for example, there are more the theoretically crucial result here, and this is actually a classic result in the, um, in the psycholinguistics literature, is that there are more looks to the cohort, more looks to the beetle than there are to the speaker, or excuse me, more looks to the beetle than there are to the carriage for a crucial time window. And that's theoretically reflecting the fact that people do not wait until the end of the word to start figuring out what they're hearing. And that is the crucial result. Language processing is incremental below the level of the word in spoken word recognition. Okay, so that's schematically, but what does it look like empirically? So this is an empirical picture of this classic study, Alapen et al. And this has the four conditions. So we already talked about the target, which is the beaker, the cohort, we have the unrelated word, and then we also have that rhyme competitor. And what you see in this region of the graph here is exactly that schematic picture that we might have predicted. That is that for the first, basically, since it takes 200 milliseconds to execute any saccades, basically, this is sort of 200 milliseconds into listening to the word beaker, um, your participants are actually looking at the beetle just as often as they're looking at the beaker. So they're really already using quite aggressively the first part of the way the word sounds. They're not looking as much at the unrelated word. They're actually already sort of looking a little bit more at the rhyme. Of course, beaker and speaker, but sp are not totally different. They're, they're more similar to each other, perhaps, in the word carriage. But there's another interesting thing to note, which is that even quite far in, there's a period where looks to the rhyme competitor actually persist after looks to the cohort competitor are dropping. That is, that it seems like the last part of the word, eker, 
And the similarity of the target and the rhyme also plays a role, even though in principle you might imagine that the beginning of the word, but, has already ruled out the rhyme. So the target initial dissimilarity to the rhyme does not completely rule out the rhyme as evidenced by the fact that there really are some lingering looks to the speaker. And that also is maybe open to theoretical interpretation. For example, maybe people don't have a perfect representation of the sounds that they heard earlier on. They have sort of a decent but imperfect representation. And so their uncertainty about did I really hear but or spa um, actually plays a role here. So that's the, um, the visual world paradigm.